Gergo is really sorry that he couldn't make it today. Uh, he's uh, back in Hungary, uh, having a great time, but he's in a secluded place uh, that there is no internet. Uh, he, he was not aware that that's going to happen, so he planned to join, but then he just went there and discovered that like 30 kilometers radius, there's absolutely no internet, so it's just like not going to work for him. Anyways, he's going to watch the recording later, so guys, we have to behave. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, uh, let me say it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea uh, Zanette. Uh, he is a PhD student at Stanford, and uh, he is co-supervised uh, by the last two authors of this paper, Michael Kohenderfer and Emma Brunskill. Uh, and he's also working very closely with uh, Alessandro Lazari. And uh, he's uh, been very active in this field that, uh, that he's going to talk about today in reinforcement learning during the past couple of years. He sort of became a go-to expert on, on some of these problems uh, related to function approximation and exploration and like how to get uh, the best of uh, everything here. Um, so uh, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to give the stage to Andrea. OK, thank oh, you. Uh, yeah. One final public comment. Uh, sorry, uh, it's just like, if you hear something strange background noise coming from me, I forgot to meet <laughs> myself. They're taking apart our, our house a little bit, but it's nothing major. It's just like, but some works are going on. All right, okay, you go. Okay, thank you very much for the intro. Um, this work is uh, learning near optimal policies with low in error error. This is a joint work between me, Alessandro Lazaric, Michael Kokinderfer and Emma Brunskill. Um, it is kindly supported by Total. Um, so what is this talk going to be about? Uh, well, um, the setting is uh, uh, data of exploration in reinforcement learning with linear function approximation. And uh, uh, what we're going to focus on uh, is uh, on the assumption that you make on the linear function class. In particular, we will try to make uh, uh, less assumption than prior literature, and we will try to see what's possible to achieve by making um, this assumption. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview for the first, uh, let's say, five or ten minutes, and then I'm going to go into more details uh, about uh, various assumptions that are out there in the literature about uh, linear function approximations, in particular, uh, low rank of linear MDPs that people have been. Uh, uh, assuming in prior works, and uh, we are going to um, introduce the working assumption, which is uh, an assumption that really comes from uh, uh, batch reinforcement learning, so let's say 10, 15 years ago. And then we are going to uh, move to the challenges of working under uh, less restrictive assumptions. So we are going to see what modification you need to make to current algorithms, uh, uh, what you can gain in terms of statistical efficiency and what you might end up losing in terms of computational efficiency. Um, the result and the algorithm, uh, they can be seen as a generalization of uh, uh, linear UCB for uh, um, Markov decision processes. Or you could uh, see the work the other way around. You can think about this as giving you some theory and some algorithm for Markov decision processes, and then you can obtain some result in the misspecified linear bandices or corollary. So when the um, time horizon is one. Okay, so what's the state of the art in uh, exploration? Well, um, I think by now we do have a fairly good understanding of the tabular setting, both in the bandit setting and in the MDP setting. Tabular setting, uh, first papers go back to Peter Auer, um, UCB, upper confidence bound, and in MDPs, uh, uh, both for the tabular, sorry, both for the finite horizon and for the infinite horizon setting, I think we are tight algorithms, they are computationally tractable, uh, they achieve the lower bound in terms of statistical efficiency. Um, we have a good understanding in terms of learning objective like PAC and regret. So I would say um, we do have working algorithms for um, tabular reinforcement learning in general. Um, the 
problem starts to arise when you move to function approximation. In general, for uh, bandits, we know still quite a lot, in particular in, in, the, in the linear setting. And some of these algorithms, they find natural application in, uh, uh, in practical applications, right? Um, but, uh, hold on, but um, um, the function approximation setting is giving a lot of trouble to uh, reinforcement learning. So when you apply it to mark decision processes, uh, it's not really clear how to conduct exploration, even in the simple case in which you have uh, linear predictors. And the setting that uh, um, we are going to consider is the following. So right now, or I would say in, in the last uh, one year, there has been a, a lot of papers about uh, uh, learning and exploring with linear function approximations, and they all make some assumption about the dynamics. I like to call these uh, uh, low rank MDPs. You can find them in the literature too as linear MDPs. I like the word low rank because it really highlights the um, the structure of the transition probability matrix. And what is this assumption about? Well, the assumption is the following. Let's say that um, you fix a policy, whatever policy it occurs to you. Well, if you fix a policy, your macro decision process becomes a macro chain. And the transition probability matrix of the macro chain uh, can be factorized into a low rank, uh, with a low rank factorization. This is the assumption for low rank MDPs. In particular, you do know uh, the left factor. The left factor is prescribed by you, and it varies as the policy varies. But this is something that you can compute. What you don't know is uh, the right factor. In general, you're not trying to um, learn the right factor because it's simply too large. The way those algorithms work, so they try to uh, use this square value iteration and they try to understand the way the transition probability matrix interact with the value function. And this is uh, like the basic scheme is not really something new because uh, it's still a least square value iteration. The novelty is uh, the exploration bonuses that those paper are using to make progress and explore the environment. The way the exploration is conducted through exploration bonuses is critically relying on the low rank transition probability matrix. And we will see that in more detail. But what's the limitation of, uh, of this setting? Well, the limitation is that this assumption of low rank is uh, uh, fairly new, if you want, uh, and it's normally not needed in batch reinforcement learning. By batch reinforcement learning, I mean the following. If I give you a set of data, and I give you, for example, a linear predictor, and I ask you to um, compute the optimal policy, you will take one of the mainstream algorithms, um, for example, least square value iteration or least square policy iteration, and you would uh, uh, try to compute an optimal policy or temporal difference learning, for example. Um, those approaches, they don't always work. Sometimes they diverge. And that's why we need some more uh, assumption about the structure of the problem. But the assumption that they make in general are less restrictive um, than low rank, meaning that this low rank that enables exploration is really a super special case of this uh, batch assumption. And so the motivation for this work is um, can we try to avoid this assumption, uh, this low rank assumption, and can we try to uh, make some of the assumptions that people have been making in uh, batch reinforcement learning, and can we still explore with those assumptions? And what are the challenges if, you do, if we do that? Well, in, uh, as a quick preview of the result we are going to obtain, we are going to be working in the same setting that people use when they apply least square value iteration. If you want, our algorithm is really requiring that um, least square value iteration works in the setting. That's the, the core assumption that we need. And this assumption is going to be more general than uh, low rank. In terms of algorithms, techniques, and results, uh, well, we are able to achieve the optimal rate in, uh, in this setting by making this assumption. Um, the optimal rate is going to be with respect to uh, the noise in the environment, so the, the variance rate, if you want, and with respect to the misspecification with respect to the batch assumption. And we also find application to uh, misspecified linear bandits. And really a takeaway, uh, or two takeaways uh, of this work is uh, the last two bullet points. There is the shift from, uh, uh, we called it local to global optimism. I'm not sure if the name uh, uh, is suggestive enough, but it's really saying uh, we can no longer be optimistic everywhere. 
like traditional or tabular uh, exploration algorithms, we might need to be optimistic only in a given state. This is simply um, the, the fact that we have too many constraints in the setting, and we are not making enough assumption to be able to achieve uh, uh, optimism everywhere. The challenge of the setting is also re reflected in the fact that we're not able to provide a polynomial time algorithm um, to ensure computational tractability. And so this is left for uh, future work. So there are ways to proceed, but still is something that uh, we are not able to achieve here. So what are those linear functional spaces? With, well, linear functional spaces, in general, the minimum assumption that people make is uh, some sort of approximate realizability. They assume that the optimal value function for uh, the optimal policy is uh, linearly parameterizable as an inner product between a feature extractor and the extractor, uh, you know it, like you know the map and you can compute it in every state and action pair, and uh, an unknown optimal parameter. So the parameter is what we're trying to um, identify. Once you know the parameter, you know the Q-star values, and if you know the Q-star values, you know the, the optimal policy. And this uh, representation induces a functional space, uh, the space of all linear value function with some bounded parameter, but don't worry about the uh, bounded parameter. And the natural question is, is realizability sufficient? It certainly is uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, but unfortunately in reinforcement learning, people have been making um, a lot of other assumptions uh, uh, using convex features, uh, uh, using the slow rank assumption, assuming linearity of the Q values, uh, deterministic transition, in Evan Bellman error, this is what we assume here, small gaps among the Q values, uh, uh, and maybe a lot of others. And chances are that uh, you made some of these assumptions in your work. And uh, I think to sort of really appreciate uh, uh, the bounce assumption, we need to, uh, to take a look at all of them and uh, briefly explain how, uh, what they mean, how they relate to each other. So a typical assumption is uh, uh, this linearity of the Q function. This is an assumption that is normally used in um, least square policy improvement. And this is often what people think about when they, when they say linear Q function. And the assumption is really that uh, for every policy, you can find a parameter that is able to represent the Q value as an inner product. So not only the optimal policy, as we said before, but just you know any policy you can uh, represent it linearly. In terms of probably efficient algorithms, we can do um, we have results for but um, um, reinforcement learning. We do know how to solve this setting if we have a generative model, but in general, for the general online exploration setting, we still don't know how to use this assumption only uh, to do exploration. And then the other assumption, um, or at least what they think about uh, um, the other big assumption when uh, you talk about the mainstream batch of reinforcement learning algorithms, is uh, the assumption that lets uh, least square value iteration uh, to work. And the, the assumption is uh, zero in Evan Bellman error. And it really means that if you start with a linear value function in your linear functional space and you apply the optimal Bellman operator, so the Bellman operator or the optimal policy only, well, in that case, uh, the assumption says you're guaranteed to be in the linear space. So as long as you keep enforcing linearity, you keep staying in the same space. We know how to do this uh, in, uh, in batch, and this work is uh, looking at the exploration set. So those two are the two batch assumptions. Then there are um, others, right? Uh, one is this low rank assumption, I would say is close to these two is actually some sort of intersection of these two assumptions. Um, we've seen it before, um, but it's strictly not required for traditional bunch algorithm to work. And then some other assumption that you find in the literature is this gap assumption. Gap assumption mean uh, um, we assume none of the above, but instead we ask that, that there is enough separation between the optimal um, action in every state and the suboptimal action. So in every state, there, there has to be a clearly identifiable action and there needs to be enough separation. So this, this gap uh, between the Q values has to be large enough. In general, this condition is a bit brittle because uh, uh, it's not really able to handle the specification. It's really relying on Monte Carlo 
a lot um, if you want to, you know, create algorithms uh, out of this assumption. And so uh, it would work if you really, if you really have an accurate predictor. Then there is this complexity assumption. Uh, we used it last year. Uh, I see it's coming up uh, on Archive um, by Chaba um, recently also. Um, the assumption would be that uh, you do have different features and uh, every feature you can essentially express it as a convex combination of some anchor features, uh, these phi i's, and you do know the phi i's. The challenge in the exploration setting is that you don't know how to collect the features here and how to uh, learn along those features to represent any other uh, feature in the uh, in the space. And then uh, there are, uh, for example, in the um, deterministic uh, uh, dynamic system, if you have no misspecification, or again, if the misspecification is very, very small, you can st still find the optimal uh, policy. So what's the relation between these uh, batch condition? And this is going to be the first result that we have uh, uh, in the paper. Um, the first result is that uh, the low rank assumption is uh, a strict subset of both uh, batch assumption. In particular, the assumption of linear Q function uh, that is core to algorithms like least square policy improvement, least square policy iteration, the low rank assumption is a, a strict subset. And likewise, uh, it is a strict subset uh, of the assumption needed for least square value iteration to work, which is the assumption that we make in this work. So the intersection of the two is uh, this low rank assumption, and yet those bunch assumptions are distinct, meaning that uh, there are some uh, uh, problems and uh, problems with uh, uh, different uh, uh, function approximations in which you would prefer to use uh, a least square value iteration type of algorithm and some other problems in which you would prefer to use uh, some least square policy improvement type of algorithm already in the batch setting. And so in exploration, it should mirror this distinction. Um, those two are two strictly distinct assumptions. And then we need to cite the uh, Bellman rank work because it's more general than uh, uh, the assumption that we make in this work. Although the actual um, work by none is really targeting small action spaces. And so they have both upper and lower bounds in uh, uh, small action spaces. So for low, low rank MDP, I'm going to go a bit faster here. Uh, we do have uh, from the literature to efficient algorithms for generative model online, and they're also computationally efficient. We don't know how to do exploration for linear Q function. And in this work, uh, we are able to achieve sample efficiency here, but not computational efficiency. And this is really the hardness of the, the batch setting, as we'll see in a, in a second. So what's really the key, the key challenge of working in uh, this uh, um, in Evan Bellman error setting, which is a superset of low rank? Well, the key challenge is the following. It's going to be contained in this slide. So I think this slide is probably going to be uh, the most important one. Um, how is the Bellman operator acting on the value function using the two different assumptions? Well, if you make this low rank assumption, um, everything that uh, uh, is outputted by uh, the transition probability matrix has to live in the range of the value function. Like it has to, to live in the range of this P function. And so any value function that uh, you apply the Bellman operator to is going to be mapped into something that has to live in this P space, simply because that's the range of the um, transition probability matrix. So for any function in input, you get something linear. Whereas the inherent Bellman error condition is telling you um, if you start with something linear, then you're guaranteed to end up linear. You're guaranteed to stay in the space. But you have to start linear. Uh, otherwise, essentially, you don't know what happens. In general, there might be some reprojection error. And indeed, least square value iteration might even diverge um, if you start messing around with the value function. 
And so from here, you can see that this condition is more general than this, because we are only making the requirement for a subset of the elements. And from here, you can see the challenge in the exploration also, because uh, the typical way to proceed is to perturb the value function and add exploration bonuses. This is true also in tabular settings. But here, we can do that, because the value function has to start linear. It has to remain linear, even if we modify it somehow to include the uh, exploration, right? And so the, the, the place to add the exploration bonus is uh, in the parameter space. So no longer in the value function space, but in the parameter space, which is something much more compact. And so what we get to is uh, some sort of optimistic linear uh, least square value iteration. Um, so how, 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 how would we go about constructing uh, an algorithm? Well, let's take, uh, um, for example, the paper by Jin, by Chi Jin, about um, optimistic least square value iteration uh, on Lorenc MDPs. The algorithm proceeds as follows. It does least square perturbed by exploration bonuses in the, um, that are added to the value function. Here we can add uh, this exploration bonus. So the starting point is still uh, some sort of least square value iteration algorithm. But the change that we can make uh, is uh, at the parameter level. So we can change the value function. Otherwise, we can make it non-linear with respect to the fee. The only thing we are allowed to do is to perturb uh, the parameter. Now, if we perturb the parameter, um, how do we obtain an actual algorithm? Well. Um, the perturbation, first of all, it has to be small because it has to reflect the statistical error that you have in the rewards and in the uh, transition that you experience. And so the perturbation has to be related to, uh, I would say, how much data you have in the um, covariance matrix. So fee, the fees are the collective features. The RTIs are the collective rewards, and uh, this uh, uh, STI plus is the collective successor state. And this sigma is the covariance matrix. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, can, sure. can I ask a quick question? Um, it's just for, for the, the previous slide. Uh, so these assumptions are concerning the MVP and the function space. And obviously, they have these implications for algorithm design that you're explaining uh -huh. now. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, in a way, clear that uh, the no inherent parameter assumption is, is more general than the other one. Uh, but do we have a simple, like, illustrative example that shows that that is a strict inclusion, like some, something that, you know, like, what, what is an MDP where, and what, what is a feature map where, uh, for that MVP, you have one and you don't have the other. Yeah, so I don't have it here in the slide. It's definitely in the yeah. paper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely in the paper because uh, we do highlight the relation between these different MVPs. Yeah. It's basically, actually, it's a sort of a nice example. It's like a chain eh, in mm -hmm. which you start in the middle and uh, you have one reward on the left side and one reward on the right side. And you okay. don't know which one is greater. And so you have to figure out, you have to transverse the chain and understand uh, which one is, is, the, is the largest one. Um, the MTP is not going to be low rank because uh, it does have deterministic transitions. And in general, low rank is not able to handle deterministic transitions un unless you make uh, um, the dimension equal to the state space. Mm -hmm. But it does have a super simple uh, function extractor in dimension two. Um, that is able to, that has essentially zero Bellman error. So. Uh, okay. Now, what is it? How, how do the features look like? Oh, they look like indicators. Okay. They look like, uh, so it's, it's a very simple example. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have it here in the slide. No, no, it's fine. It's, it's fine. We can look it up. It's, 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 it's a good answer. Thanks. Okay. Um, in terms of algorithm, um, so yes, we are adding this Xi, um, and then what are we going to do? Well, if you want to be optimistic, uh, you should try to 
optimize over this psi. And what are you optimizing? You're optimizing the value function at the beginning. So this guy here, maximum over functions, is really the value function at the initial state. Um, and this is pretty much the only way I know that you can proceed because uh, this Bellman error is making strong requirement. You're not able to uh, mess around too much with the value function. It's a statement only about the optimal policy with respect to a certain value function. So you have to take max here, for example. And then the square is pretty much something that uh, uh, is well established. And uh, you wouldn't want to touch that too much uh, um, in terms of statistical efficiency. And so this implies uh, this uh, move from local to global optimism. Let me clarify the local means uh, um, optimism everywhere, like global, which is the perspective that we have in this paper, really means uh, we are maybe not optimistic point-wise everywhere, but we are optimistic at some initial state. And why is this? Well, because uh, in the lower end case, uh, you can add exploration bonuses. You take your linear value function, linear with respect to phi, and you add exploration bonuses, which are nonlinear because they are linear product with the covariance matrix. Uh, they do have, uh, there is a square root here, uh, and so it's going to look um, somehow different. Um, but the key is that uh, you can add those bonuses and be optimistic. While here, if you can do that, uh, you can only choose different parameter, different theta parameter, and end up with linear value functions. And already from here, you can appreciate some of the challenge, um, because uh, uh, here you might have many solutions that are optimistic, whereas in the in Nevenbellman error case, it might be that there is only one uh, solution that is optimistic, because you have like many more constraints. You can, you can leave the linear space. And so this makes it uh, more challenging from a computational standpoint, because uh, uh, really here, if you wanted to be optimistic everywhere, you will need to precisely identify the value function, which means you solve the problem. So in general, we won't be able to be uh, optimistic everywhere, and we'll target the initial uh, state. And so if you run the algorithm, uh, they're going to look like this. So this is kind of the traditional way, right? Uh, it might be Chijin's paper or any tabular algorithm or anything else pretty much in the uh, linear function approximation space, um, they're going to be optimistic everywhere. Whereas what we can do here is we target only uh, an initial state and we try to be optimistic there, which means uh, you need to receive the starting state before you invoke this planning procedure. Otherwise, if you, if you do the planning and then uh, you're, you're assigned a random state to start your exploration, you might start in a, in a place which is pessimistic and potentially uh, the, the like nature that is giving you the starting state may uh, be adversarial. So you may give you a starting state where you're not optimistic and you keep failing to make progress. And so if this is a trajectory of the agent, it's gonna look like this. You're gonna be optimistic in the initial state, but then in the intermediate states that the agent uh, is uh, um, seeing, you're not going to be able to ensure optimism. Yet, this is enough if you want to achieve uh, an optimal rate. Now that, you, that we got some more um, understanding about the value function and how the algorithm operates, we can see two effects. Um, one is about statistical complexity, and the other is about computational uh, complexity. Um, in terms of statistical efficiency, uh, there is actually some uh, good news uh, if you want to keep the value function linear. Um, and where is the, the good news coming from? Well, it's coming from least square. Uh, um, in general, the amount of optimism that you need to inject has to be comparable to your estimation error. So it's important to understand how well we can estimate uh, uh, this uh, theta hat, like how close it is uh, to the uh, best parameter you would obtain in the limit of infinite data for a given value function. And the issue is, in general, those data are highly correlated in the sense that this value function 
uh, is really constructed, uh, for example, in, uh, in the lower rank setting using uh, this theta hat, which is given from a regression using samples downstream. We're working in the uh, finite horizon setting. So this is coming from all the samples downstream. But the samples downstream uh, depend on the samples, like the place that you're visiting right now, so the rewards and the states. And in addition, it depends on the, co on the covariance matrix. And so they are, you know, it's highly correlated. So you do need some uniform concentration um, uh, on, uh, on this statistical uh, uh, quantity, right? And the way to do that is, in general, to do a union bound. But the value function um, is going to be quite complicated if you add exploration bonuses. In general, it has more degrees of freedom. It depends, in particular, on d squared degrees of freedom, because it depends on t degrees of freedom, on the state parameter, and on d squared for the covariance matrix. Whereas, if you're able to work by maintaining linearity, you have a smaller, a smaller set to cover. So think about the function of spaces. Here, uh, you have a d squared degrees of freedom. Here, you only have d because the value function stays linear. So in terms of statistical efficiency, you would like to work um, by keeping the value function linear. Of course, the comparison uh, it really becomes backwards if you're talking about uh, uh, in what setting the algorithms can work because uh, this is going to fail in uh, some more general setting, which we consider this is going to succeed. So the advantage would be in the low rank setting. So if you were, if you were to apply both algorithms to the low rank setting, you would have a saving uh, of D in terms of statistical efficiency, normally saving of D uh, when you convert them to minimax results, uh, they end up with a saving of uh, square root of D. So it's the same. Uh, uh, dependence on the horizon, and, and k is the number of episodes. Now, we are able to gain in, in statistical complexity, and actually this can be uh, um, a suggestion to do some uh, research for uh, computationally tractable algorithm for low-rank MDPs, uh, if you can uh, really remove this uh, d factor. Um, but we do lose something in terms of computational complexity. And this is unfortunately uh, an issue with the, with the setting because uh, once again, uh, usual least square algorithm uh, using this exploration bonus um, is very interpretable in the sense that uh, you can compute uh, a closed form expression. Um, and for me, I've already, you can understand this computationally tractable. Sure, you need to iterate over the action. You may need to update the covariance matrix, but in general is implementable um, with polynomial um, in polynomial time. And in general, really without understanding anything, this is the exploration bonus is added to the value function. The bigger the exploration bonus, the more optimistic you are. If you're too optimistic, simply it won't work. But you have a given direction to move the value function to, to ensure optimism. So if you add a large enough exploration bonus, you're going to be fine. Whereas in this work, if we, if you add some perturbation to the value function, uh, you don't really know what's a good direction um, because uh, like it's, you know, going left or going right. Uh, uh, like in, what is a good direction that ensure optimism? In general, direction are gonna be different for each state and action pair. And uh, the, um, the perturbation that you're adding, it really has to make the value function optimistic at the initial state. So this may be, uh, it's not very clear how to achieve these. In terms of uh, computational tractability, so if, you, if you're writing down this program and uh, you're forgetting about setting the value of Xi yourself, uh, um, this in general is gonna be a quadratic constraint if you start squaring things, but unfortunately you're maximizing and maximizing and convexity in general, they don't play well because you can, you can go uh, in, uh, you can get stuck uh, along the constraint um, in, uh, in a place that is locally uh, optimal. And then, uh, of course, you can ask the question, what happens if the Neven Bellman error is non-zero? Um, in general, uh, models are never correct. So remember, 
this Neumann-Bellman manera condition, if you start linear, you end up linear. If you're violated, in general, you start linear, but you're not guaranteed to end up linear. And so you need to project back to the space, and this projection gives you some error. The projection is something that is naturally done in the square. Um, the problem is how big is this error? And to measure that, uh, um, you can find uh, some some of the old definition in uh, uh, in the bus paper. Um, what we do here, we use the infinity norm um, type of error, simply because the agent is exploring different uh, uh, distribution, like it's, it's trying different policies. And so um, a distinction between uh, um, the inevitable error definition of uh, uh, paper by Munos et al. is that you're not evaluating the agent on the distribution that is uh, um, on the distribution that is given to you for sampling, but you're evaluating the agent on something else entirely because it's making prediction about different actions. And so it um, becomes a bit tricky to define P norm um, using different distribution as is the case in the bad setting. And uh, this in Evan Bellman error is uh, uh, really measuring uh, these reprojection errors. You start with your value function, you apply the Bellman operator, you end up leaving the value function, and the distance between the closest point in the linear value function space is what is called in Evan Bellman error. Once again, this is in the infinity norm. And so in terms of main result, uh, we, do, we do have uh, this algorithm that was uh, uh, illustrated before, eh? and this is achieving um, a high probability regret that precisely matches the lower bound. So it is unimprovable in terms of statistical rate um, and in terms of misspecification. Here k is the number of episodes and d is the dimension of the feature. Uh, so we have the optimal rate in uh, misspecification, which looks like an extension of linear bandits. And uh, we do have this uh, uh, loss compared to the um, best predictor, if you want. So I is um, this uh, lack of closure, if you want. Uh, I guess it's not a surprise that uh, minimum error you can make is uh, uh, increasing linearly with the misspecification. But, but you also the square root of the feature dimensionality. Uh, so this is going to be one of the first results, uh, or at least uh, one of the first tight results in uh, um, using Bass assumption. Uh, and it does apply to Lorenc MDPs, and there it saves uh, a square root of D factor because we are using uh, a value function that has a lower complexity. There is some hardness uh, given by um, large action spaces. Uh, and so the algorithm from uh, none, it will not strictly apply here, even though the setting is uh, um, a setting with low um, Bellman rank. So Bellman rank is more general, but the way uh, the algorithm there is constructed, it does use uh, uh, the assumption that the action space is small. And that is really already in the assumption, actually, because you can also find a lower bound the function of uh, uh, Bellman rank, eh? the scales with a number of actions. And so it means you need to make some extra assumption uh, to achieve tractability, statistical tractability here. Unfortunately, um, computational tractability remains open. And uh, this is something left for future work. Um, and you can find though, an application to linear bandits of this algorithm, or you can see it the other way. You can see it. You can see the MDP algorithm as being uh, um, an extension to MDP is starting from linear UCB. Why is there a connection? Well, if you apply the algorithm with horizon h equal to one, uh, you just have a simple problem, and uh, it turns out you can solve the problem um, in a sort of closed form, if you're okay with maximizing all of the actions, and it gives the usual exploration bonuses in linear bandits. Um, in that case, the inevitable manero becomes really the reward misspecification. 
and the, the novelty, if you want, uh, of this, uh, uh, the follows as a corollary from uh, the main theorem is uh, that this algorithm with a different choice of alpha is going to be able to handle misspecified contextual linear bandits. Now, there are some other uh, works that are able to achieve this. For example, uh, Chaba has a similar work um, that doesn't actually require the knowledge of the misspecification and works if the problem is non contextual, as well as uh, this uh, uh, modification, the same that we produce here. And this is really a, like the, 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 it's really a variation of, uh, uh, if you want, Chigin's algorithm, only that is using a sharper analysis in the linear bandit setting to avoid uh, uh, extra square root of d factors. Now, the question is, uh, uh, is, is this really uh, needed? Like, do you really need to modify the linear UCB algorithm as it is, uh, or is this in everything, like, is the original algorithm already in everything? Uh, good properties in uh, uh, misspecified problems. Well, um, you can find, uh, for example, the, the proof um, in uh, Chaba and Tor uh, paper. But here, I just want to write uh, or give you one slide about uh, what are the issues of having to deal with misspecified problems. In general, in machine learning, you have a, a certain data distribution, you're fitting the data, and you're going to be roughly accurate uh, on this distribution, providing that um, the, the, the data are approximately linear. In the reinforcement learning, the issue that we have is that uh, the, the agent is changing distribution. So initially, it might really be uh, seeing only a couple of samples, and uh, you know it might be located in a certain area of the MDP. And so when you do a fit over there, um, sure, uh, maybe you can feed those data linearly in a perfect way, but you're going to make uh, a large prediction error on uh, uh, actions um, that uh, you haven't seen, on points that you haven't seen before. And even more so, when you go to the exploration setting, really the optimism that you inject um, it is, is necessary to counteract the prediction error that you make. And so if you make a very large prediction error, you need to inject uh, a bigger bonus. And in general, you do need to modify uh, reinforcement learning algorithms to take into account uh, this uh, model misspecification. Then we can discuss a lot, uh, is this really necessary in practice? Well, in general, Lean UCB works well, even without the misspecification, uh, the misspecification correction. And, uh, uh, I would add to that that uh, correcting the algorithm for like to handle the misspecification is not really something you want to make because it's way too conservative. And how does this uh, correction looks like? Well, the correction is really in the exploration bonus, and uh, it's really adding something that learn the, sorry that grows with the number of samples that you collect. And the objective is really to avoid a situation like this. It's really, you know, if you have a, a bonus that is growing um, with the number of iteration, um, really this is encouraging you to play direction that uh, you that you haven't really seen before, or direction where you don't have enough data. So it's forcing you, for example, to play this point down here so that you would tend to fit uh, uh, all the data. And so when you apply this algorithm, like our algorithm, to me specify linear bandit problems, you do get this linear UCB um, type of algorithm. And the regret is the traditional one for linear UCB plus some uh, term that depends on the misspecification. In particular, the name Manero becomes the reward misspecification on bandits. It's going linearly, and there is the same square root of d as we had for MDPs, and this square root of d is unavoidable. So this result is tight. Um, computational tractability is not a problem for bandits, simply because uh, it's not an issue to compute uh, <coughs> the maximizing parameter through the exploration bonus for all the action that you have in a given state. And that's all you need to do. <clears throat> the issue is that you do know 
you do need to know the specification level to correct the algorithm. And in general, this is not something that you want to do. <clears throat> and it is not a correction that you want to make in practice because uh, um, it may end up being a bit too conservative. And the algorithm is not going to work well in practice. In terms of future work, uh, um, I want to just give uh, one slide on uh, some of the things we're working on right now, um, which is this uh, um, computational tractability issue. Um, so if, if you write down this program and you're maximizing um, for the initial state, and the program is convex and you're maximizing, uh, it looks like there's no many other ways around. And so we are pulling uh, one of the old ideas about uh, Thompson sampling. You could see Thompson sampling in very different ways. You could see uh, as doing some relaxation on the intractable optimization program. The relaxation is still uh, um, convex and you're maximizing, so it's not any better. But still, you can find many more solutions that are optimistic, simply because you're enlarging the space. Or you can see the algorithm you know, in, in many other ways. And uh, so if you do inject noise, uh, actually, um, you can find, uh, uh, you can do some progress uh, if you inject it in the right way. Um, issue is uh, often these randomized algorithms, they are quite difficult to analyze because uh, um, you can't, for example, it's much more difficult to keep the iterates bounded. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, put constraints, for example, on the parameter, your, your parameter uh, that you're uh, computing during the regression may just go away and depart to infinity. You would like to do some projection, but in general, the projection is quite difficult to analyze with uh, um, with Thompson sampling. So if, you, if you're injecting um, noise to encourage exploration, then it becomes very difficult to understand uh, how to do the projection, how to keep the inter iterates bounded, and how to make the algorithm work. Okay, I think this is everything, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we had quite a few questions in the chat. Um, I don't know who wants to start. I, I hope you guys didn't speak because I wasn't able to hear anything. No. If you want. Okay, good. I do have a question just to uh, it's perfect. Uh, so you, you talked about the necessary for this covering argument uh, in these algorithms. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether that's really necessary uh, or you could be just a little bit lazy uh, and just like, uh, you know, avoid the covering argument altogether. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh something is needed, uh, you can certainly find ways around it, but I'm not sure if it will solve the problem. Okay. Um, so wait, wait, so let me, let me put the slide first. Huh? Okay. So, okay, first let's agree that there is a problem in the sense that um, you take a trajectory, mm -hmm. right? And you have a succession of state mm -hmm. and then the value function here depends on all the states that you see uh, from time step, whatever, t plus one up to the end. But those states uh, depend uh, on the current one. And so this value function in general is related to, um, to the states, the other states that you see. In particular, it's related to, for example, like all these states are related to. Yeah, in, in a nutshell, what's happening is that if you're trying to use all data, data that led to the value function that you're trying to improve upon, then you're gonna have this trouble. But maybe being lazy could be that could mean just that 
so you decided to, uh, you know, follow this policy and you follow this policy forever, I collect new data and then you use the new data to, to make the improvement. Uh, did you look into what is the cost of, of doing that? Is that too much? Yeah, so actually we did try to do something along those lines, but I think we were losing a factor of age, which is bad in general. Factor of age. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Because basically you can discuss some of the data, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's you're trading an age and a D factor, is that? I sort of remember getting something like that. So not here, but if you want to start uh, discovering some data. Here in the algorithm, no, there is only a saving. Yeah. But that's because the value function is, is linear. It's perfectly linear. And so basically the covering argument is not adding anything to what you would get out of linear bandits. If yeah. you want. Yeah. yeah. Because the, the D dimension is already implicit yeah. on the yeah. in uh, yeah. yeah, there's no, no big price. Mm -hmm. There is no big price, no. You're basically losing a constant factor. Okay. Nan, you had a couple of questions. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andrew, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, I think I had a comment about LSPI. So uh, I'm not fully sure about yeah. that, but uh, uh, I, I think for LSPI, you it basically uses LSTD as a um, subroutine, right? And that one, uh, we've been looking at it for quite a while. In in addition to the assumptions listed here, it requires a very weird uh, matrix invertibility assumption um which uh, uh well, well, i mean i myself haven't really figured out how to best interpret that assumption but i think that that's something to you know caution a little bit here right so because that assumption it, the reason is because like that assumption you can like guarantee that with another sufficient condition that says if if the if the importance weights of uh, marginalized importance weights for policy pi is also linear in your features, then that assumption will be always satisfied. But that's, you know, uh, so, so that's why I, 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 you know, caught out for a little bit of caution. Um, I see. Yeah. So, uh, I think my, uh, you know, my, my sort of main comment slash question is again, like related to what, uh, actually said in the, uh, in the um, in the chat, that uh, you can actually adapt the Olive algorithm to the setting by removing the uniform uh, action, uh, uh, the uniform sampling of action that that step in the algorithm, but it results in an algorithm that is quite different from yours. So I, I think there are very two interesting sort of trade off versus like options here. The first one is actually just the, do you want to do random deviation or not? So you don't do random deviation here, right? So it works fine. Uh, but, but you know, Olive is designed for this like more general setting yeah. where we actually find that there are some cases where you just have to do a random deviation. Otherwise you suffer from, you know, exponential sample complexity. So uh, I, I have always been like, dissatisfied unsatisfied with like we have to make a hard sort of choice here uh the other the other uh difference which i i'm more interested in learning your opinion on is you know in, in your case you do you sort of do like the squared version of everything right so mm -hmm. um because in here in belmayer is you know defined in under like uh l2 sort of uh notions mm -hmm. Whereas Olive does everything in some sense in L1, right? So we, we calculate this, what we call mm -hmm. average Bellman error, where this is like very similar to what people do in like, you know, ALP kind of setting. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take between L1 and L2? For, for me, it seems to me that L1 is sort of closer to what we need because, you know, eventually the, the, the goal of RL is to 
maximize expected return, right? So our, our, oh, yeah, there's yeah, no sure. square. Yeah. Love to sure. hear your thoughts on these points. No, yeah, the, you, you're making a super valid point. Um, so yeah, so in general, if you're able to work in expectation um, and you're like approximately correct in expectation, that's kind of what you want. So here, for example, we have these conditions uh, on the on the infinity norm. Probably they're coming because we are using uh, the square. Um, but in general, we would like to go in uh, in the direction that you're saying. So we would like to uh, measure things uh, either in L1 or to say, you know, in expectation, we are approximately correct, uh, which is, you know, roughly the same thing. Um, so yeah, definitely. I'm not sure if I answered your question or. Yeah, no, I'm fine. It's like it's it's a common slash question, so yeah, I think yeah. this is just random yeah. chat. <laughs> yeah. So if uh, like on, on this discussion of Avon versus Atus, the Atus is really coming from the least square stuff, right? Uh, yeah. The, the yes. What? Least squares. Uh, least squares. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the L two like the the reason. Yeah, yeah. You would start with making assumption about the two errors is because the least squares yeah. care for the two errors, and uh, if you want to change that to something else, then presumably you would need to change least squares because least squares are not going to care that much about, for example, album errors, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so then it goes back to how do you computationally efficiently deal with you know other norms. Uh, and I guess like that, that's where you're kind of stuck a bit. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, actually, had some, okay, some of the comments uh, we have heard from them, I guess, but uh, we had other comments. Uh, actually, do you have a mic? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I think this one maybe, hey, great talk, Andrea. I, I think this one, um, maybe you answered in response to Chaba, but I'm actually wondering if this, like d to the three half square root k is like tight for computationally efficient algorithms, huh. even for low rank MDP. Like I, I don't really know how one would prove that, but it would be quite remarkable in some sense. I'm wondering if you have an opinion on this. Yeah, so it's, it's generally very difficult to prove a lower bound on computational efficiency, right? Um, I. So I don't think it's really like it really has to be there. It's there because we don't need to, like, we don't know how to explore in other ways. For example, let's say this. Let's say, you know, Thompson sampling. There is this conjecture that Thompson sampling is, uh, is picking up an extra, an extra square root of D, even in the bandit problems. But, you know, in practice, maybe this doesn't happen. And oh, so if we no, able... no, that, uh, that extra square root of D has to be there. There's been a new paper. So the D, to the, D to the 3 by 2. Can't yeah. you obtain anything? Right. Uh, all the sampling, it has to be there. Like you have to do this inflation, otherwise you get rid of regret. Probably. Yeah. Like maybe there's not something maybe that is no. losing the analysis. No. No. Oh, interesting. So you can't remove it at all if you do Thompson sampling. Yeah. yeah. Probably. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Well. So that removes part of the answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so no, I, I don't know. Uh, for example, you can think about uh, taking this value function and um, uh, somehow you add this exploration bonus, uh, but maybe you were able to sort of filter this extra component and do some projection before you call the statistical uh, confidence interval, something along those lines. And so that might give you the square root of D7. I have no idea, honestly. Uh, it doesn't seem straightforward to remove uh, uh, the square root of D in the low rank uh, setting with computational tractability. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. That's that's. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to see what we can get here. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, can I, I realized I had another problem or question. Uh, so can I ask him? Yeah, sure. go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, regarding the global versus uh, local optimism, 
uh, my sense is that, yeah, according like just as what I wrote in chat, I think in, you know, even if your algorithm maintains local optimism, right? Uh, I think, I mean, I haven't like uh, really like uh, walked through that many uh, exploration analysis, but among the ones I've seen, in your proof, you always, it seems like you always only need uh, what was so, uh, global optimism, right? Uh, are there exceptions? Yeah. Andrew, what, what's, do you know if there are exceptions or all the analysis you've seen also work like that? Well, what do you mean if there are exceptions? So th this is something that like we require to be optimistic at the initial state simply because the setting doesn't allow you to be optimistic everywhere unless you know right exactly. right uh, yeah 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 I, I agree i agree this is uh, this is your setting like and also that's the same for olive but i'm saying like for yeah. for example even in a tabular setting where you can afford yeah. to be uh optimistic everywhere in the algorithm but it seems like in the analysis when you prove that you can do efficient exploration it seems like being optimism uh, being optimistic at the initial state usually is enough to induce uh, yeah, yeah. good exploration. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Actually, uh, the analysis of Thompson sampling, they work that way. So if you look at Daniel Russo's paper, for example, uh, that is doing uh, like new rips last year, uh, he's analyzing LSVI in the tabular setting. They, he can prove that, that the algorithm is optimistic at the initial state with some probability. And you know, that's enough. Be optimistic with some probability is enough because uh, with some probability you're essentially like an optimistic algorithm and so you're making progress and the other times uh, it's okay uh, don't worry but at least to uh, say 30 percent of the time you're making some progress but in general uh, algorithms that are randomized they are um, optimistic at the initial state uh, uh, at the initial state probably with some probability and that's it maybe in some other states here and there depending on the problem and uh, so, you know, it's not required that you're optimistic in every state of action. Does this address you? Right, right, right. Or... Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's just very convenient uh, um, to be largely optimistic, right, in, in, in tabular algorithms because you have this induction argument, uh, you know, if you're optimistic downstream, uh, you just need to add a little bonus and, and so uh, it just works. But then you see that from here, you have some looseness uh, in practice, right, because really adding more and more optimism at every level and this thing is going to pile up and the algorithm is going to be a bit slow exactly exactly well actually but but that actually you know points out to some you know sort of conflict in 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 the setting you're studying and also you know in olive's setting so so for example in olive setting we've also tried to do like uh local optimism because that seems more computationally tractable but then like just errors like keep yeah. blowing up exponentially and we just have to give up. But eventually we get an algorithm that is computationally intractable. I wonder if that's also the case for you. Like yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is the computational intractability also coming from uh, actually like a global optimism? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, exactly because of what you're saying in the sense that if you try to be optimistic everywhere, then in the end, uh, you go back to this idea of adding exploration bonuses, right? But then, uh, uh, if you want to relax the assumption, uh, you don't know what kind of exploration bonus mean that uh, you might get an error that uh, uh, is exploding exponentially. So, yeah, precisely the same thing. I see, thanks. Hmm. I wanted to ask here, actually, like you guys Gaga had this uh, paper about this uh, duality approach. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I kept thinking about why Andrea was giving the talk. The, the, the can... tabular one? Hmm? The tabular one? Oh, sh they had results for the some linear settings. So, for example, yeah, we had, had results. But I, I let Kira. Maybe, maybe she thought about this uh, as well by listening to your talk. I was wondering whether under these assumptions you could do something with those tricks that. that I recommend. 
so you could have like so, so yeah we wrote our linear programs under the assumption of the factored linear models mm -hmm. so that's what we used to be able to formulate the primal i think uh -huh. And then once we did that and took the dual, we got something that looked quite similar to what your optimization problem is here. In if you formulate the primal in a certain way, yeah. Um, so the global optimism was definitely there. You yeah, were and optimistic so it was local. Okay. If you so yeah. there's different formulations of how you write. So our primal, we were looking at confidence sets around a transition function, which could be factorized if we're considering the linear case. And depending on how you construct those confidence sets, you can get the local, like um, like Qi Jin and their results, or you can get this global result as well. But we, yeah, we didn't really look outside the factored linear model, so I don't know. Yeah, but this is just a little bit outside. <laughs> yeah, it is only a little bit, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, Maybe a really question to this is that uh, so uh, things that we are navigating somewhere in between model based and model free with these uh, models uh, or these these algorithms, and so what, what are your thoughts about that? Like, uh, could we uh, like maybe the model based uh, approach? Okay, well, it's usually hard, but uh, uh, there is this result by Kiara and Gergő that says that sometimes it's it's not harder. Uh, Model based uh, is kind of giving you some uh, extra information, and I see that as easier. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, lower cost yeah. for exploration. Um. In general, in general, a problem of model based is that you don't know how to do the computation. Yeah, like here. <laughs> like here, sure, like here. But maybe here you can do something like you know this Thompson sampling thing, right? And well, I try to do the same thing with model based. No, but how do you compute uh, the good value functions? Well, once you uh, once you sample a model, let, let's say you use some sure, sure, you you can do this that. It's not a problem. True, true. Yeah, so it seems to me that it's like, yeah. So in general, it should be a bit safer to do model based. I feel you have less of these problems of extrapolation and explosion of error because you know that's your p matrix. And, yeah. And it should look like a transition probability matrix, even if it is empirical. Like even if you're, uh, if it's coming out of some model that you have, uh, I think you you're able to make it look like a transition probability matrix. So it shouldn't um, extrapolate. Mm -hmm. This is what, what I feel. Okay. I think it has less the, less of that issues. Well, okay, that, that's funny because uh, at one point I realized that, well, I, I kind of realized that in model based RL, you don't necessarily need to uh, enforce that your models are look like transition kernels. And I was kind of happy about that because maybe it helps with computation. Uh, <laughs> I know you're saying that because it's. Uh, transition no. kernel, maybe that's going to be advantages in some other ways. Uh, it's maybe true, yeah. So at least you have the option, right? Like you should be having the option of saying, uh, uh, okay, it should roughly look like a transition probability matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. All right. Um, I have a quick question. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I was wondering, it's, it's more high level. I was wondering what is your thoughts uh, 
if you want to extend this uh, low rank factorization for distribution of setting, um, uh, like, do you think uh, whether it's, it would be possible and would, what would be the implication of this, and especially with respect to the bound that, that you, you provided? The distribution of setting, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, like when, when we consider distribution over the value function, right? Um, in distribution on RL overall, I mean, uh, like either the value function or, or, um, or basically, um, the reward, um, if you could say. Um. Yeah, so I think in general, the, the low rank setting is a nice setting to play with. And uh, you can get pretty far in terms of obtaining results because essentially you can reuse all the machinery from uh, either uh, linear appendix or, or at least, you know, these tabular ideas of adding more and more optimism. So if you have some ideas that work, for example, in the tabular setting, let's say reward free exploration just you know to, to name something completely different you should be able to pop it to the rank set out and so pretty much anything that you have in mind should go through in the long thanks yeah uh, great alex do you want to maybe stop recording